talk today are describing how compassionate connected care is used to reduce patient suffering, implementing the practice to consistently recognize that anxiety is a form of suffering, identifying personal preferences that allow you to care for the person as well as the patient, and personalize the key behavioral strategies uh, to be effective and integrate them into your daily work routine. So the first objective we'll be talking about is describing how this connect, compassionate connected care is used to reduce our patients' suffering. So these are all the different areas and themes that we're going to be talking about through the separate modules. The highlighted purple section are the two that we're going to be talking about today. We're going to recognize that anxiety is suffering and understand how caring transcends our patient's diagnosis. So, the more people that are uh, verbal and talk during this session makes it go a lot quicker. Um, so there will be a lot of questions that pop up such as this one where I'll ask for audience participation. Um, so can anybody share why they decided to work in healthcare specifically? To help others. To help others, okay. Anybody else? To give back. To give back. Really great example. So the reason why we started the Compassionate Connected Care uh, program was we had noticed, you know, over time, especially because of the pandemic, um, there have been several times where we got really task oriented. We're just going to the next patient, the next patient, to the next patient. We're just getting it done. We're taking care of people. We're keeping them alive, right? We're getting the rooms clean. We're checking people in. Um, we're doing what we have to do right now. And sometimes we forget, or it falls off, that our patients are people. And that the more compassion and connection we have with them, actually the, the healthier they are and the, they get better faster. Um, so it's something that's very interesting that has been studied for a while. And so it's something um, that we also want to support here at Methodist Fremont Health. And not only is this for our patients, but it's for our coworkers and for ourselves that we need to care for as well. So we've all had days like this, we're like crying in the supply room, like no one told me it would be like this. So the intention of this program is to help us walk through um, situations like this and hopefully make it easier on ourselves, our coworkers, and our patients as well. So working in healthcare gives us uh, the difference, like you guys said, to make uh, the ability to make a difference every day in other people's lives. Our impact can be even greater when we deliver that with care and compassion. So we asked our patients what they consider suffering is. These are several different words that came up over and over again. Anytime they have anxiety, when they're annoyed, when they're in pain, they're confused, they don't know what's going on, worried about something, distressed about something. They're afraid of what's coming next. So this was one of the most interesting parts that I found in this training was the two different types of suffering. Um, they break it down this way in ways that things that can be prevented, things that are avoidable, and ways that are inherent. They exist as a natural part of something. So we have two separate goals in this area. So if it's something that can be prevented, our goal would be to prevent suffering by optimizing care delivery, uh, answering the call light faster, being quieter in the hallway, knocking before we enter, asking them if it's okay to enter, things like that. Um, that decreases their anxiety. Things we can avoid. Inherent is existing as a natural part of something. So we try to alleviate by responding to their specific symptoms or their needs immediately. But we might ne necessarily not be able to avoid that type of suffering because it becomes part of their diagnosis. So when we ask our patients, what are things that we do that cause <coughs> increased suffering for you? This was what their responses were. Long wait types for a call, call button. I hit my call button. I don't know. Is it working? Is it not going off? No one's coming in here. Um, talking about workload or being short staffed. I know it's pretty common when we rush into the room. Sorry, I'm late. We're short staffed today. It's, it's part of our regular conversation and it's something that really bothers our patients um, to hear. Um, rushed, rushed communication. I don't know. We'll figure that out later. I have to go take care of this. I have to go do this first. Let me go get your meds first. Um, inaccurate whiteboards. That was something that was huge to them as well. If you walk into the room and notice that the date is two or three days off or it doesn't have the right people listed. They don't know who's caring for them. They've been in here for days. 
Some of them don't see the sun rise or set, so they have no idea what day it is. So keeping that updated helps reduce their anxiety. Clutter and unkept looking environments. So trash or dirty linens, things like that laying around in the room was a big bother for them as well. So these are ways that we, when we ask the patients, what are things that we can do to help reduce those situations? Introducing ourselves was a big one. They said, a lot of people come and go out of my room and I'm not really sure who they are or what they're here for. Talking with the patient about something that is, is about them as a person and not a patient. You'll hear a lot of us walk around and, and ask you guys, because we want to keep people engaged in the compassionate connection um, care, is that we'll ask you, tell me one thing about a patient you treated today that has nothing to do with why they're here. Our patients appreciate that. You're getting to know them as a person. Managing up other members of the care team, walking in and not saying, I'm not sure why your nurse isn't here, but I'll take care of what you need. We wanna turn more towards, you have the best nurse, and I'm sure she's like super busy today, but you're probably next on her list. Um, you are important to her, just like you are important to me. We'll make sure you get what you need. Keeping the patient informed, let them know the most information you possibly can. Um, you're gonna have an x-ray. It'll probably be between this time and this time. You're, I'm gonna bring your meds back in the next 10 or 15 minutes. Um, we do have those clock watchers, so we understand that, but the more information you can give them, the better. And then purposeful rounding and bedside handoff. They love to see that we're working as a team. They love to know that we all know the same information. That way they don't have to repeat it six different times. So what are ways that you guys kind of recognize now that might be adding to patient suffering? <coughs> Things that you do in your everyday. I can say with me, I'm quite a loud person, so I sometimes have kind of trained myself that when I swipe my badge to go onto the floor, I need to back it down a notch. Just bring it down one notch because I'm a loud person. And uh, sometimes that can upset people in the hallway, so, or the patients in their rooms. Anybody else have an example? I think our pagers or beavers or oh my gosh, cell phones, phones going off. Phones, yes. And then you're like, I have to answer this or it's not gonna quit beeping. I yep. think that just makes them feel like, oh, I gotta hurry up. Right, and it makes them feel unimportant. Right. We, we had heard some feedback too from people that when they see your phone out, even if you are looking at them, if your phone is out like on your workstation or near you, they don't feel like you're hearing what they're saying. Even if you're not looking at it, it's just out in, in invisible areas. Anything else? I would say the work phones, you know, the constant call lights going off. Yeah. Um, I can't tell you how many times yesterday I was interrupted in a patient or in a conversation with a patient right. trying to provide care and I had other people calling me for other Maybe patients something. that had to run right out. Right. Uh, yeah. That makes it hard. So what are ways do you think that you can do, what, different ways you think you can reduce the suffering? Because we know that causes anxiety and suffering for our patients. What are some ways that we can avoid those situations? What can we do better? Keeping the phone in our pocket, keeping it on the workstation out of the patient's view. That's a great idea. Hand off your phone. If someone is calling your phone, if you have somebody to hand it off to, take it out in the hallway. Can you answer this for me? Tell them I'll call them right back. Or if I can't, if they're calling specifically for me, then I say, oh, this is Amy. You know, take care of your leader and step out. Perfect. So they, they know who's going to be stepping in for them. Yeah. That would be super helpful. So these are ways that our patients tell us how we can help. Acknowledge me and make me feel welcome when I arrive. I don't know how many times I've walked through the lobby just, you know, busting through looking for a bathroom or something, and I see somebody walk in the lobby and they're kind of looking around, and I just, I'm beeline straight to what I was doing because I, I gotta get there, I gotta get my things done. Instead of just saying, hey, if you need something, I'm sure they'll be back at the, you know, at the front desk here shortly. Um, so just welcoming people when they walk in or saying hi, even a smile, something as, as small as that. Look for opportunities to reduce noise. Like I said, I have tried to train myself that when I swipe that badge, okay, I need to lower it a notch. 
Everyone can respond to my call light, even if you can't take care of my need. Just coming in and saying, I see you need help, and I'll try and get somebody here to help you, if it's not something that you can help them with. A lot of times it's very simple things, like I can't reach my phone to order my lunch. I can't find my menu, things like that. Anybody can help with something like that. Narrate my care so I know what is happening, what I expect, and key things I should know. Something that came up in another one of our sessions, somebody said, you know, if I tell, I walk in and say, this is the procedure I'm going to do, they may have not had it done before. We all expect they know exactly what we're doing when we walk in. Um, it can reduce a lot of anxiety by saying, I'm gonna be doing an EKG. That's gonna read different parts of your heart. I'm gonna be putting these stickers on your chest. Are you okay with that? Taking that extra few minutes to explain to them what's going to be happening makes a huge difference. And this is not all new information. This is stuff we've all heard before. Being warm and welcoming in all interactions. They want everybody to know that they are a person and they want to be part of the team too. Don't talk about them around them. Talk with them. Anxiety is suffering. So we value empathy here at Methodist Fremont Health. I uh, love this quote by Theodore Roosevelt. No one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Does that make sense to you guys? It's a big difference. It makes a big difference when your parents, parents, patients feel like you care about them. So empathy is rich in understanding of another person's perspective. It's understanding of not only the words, but the associated emotions that they're feeling as well. Here is a video that we're gonna watch about the difference between empathy and sympathy. And it's a great explanation and just breaks it down into very simple terms. Dollar. <laughs> so I thought that was a really good example. Um, I hear a lot of people use the at least. Like, oh, well, don't feel so bad about it. At least, blah, blah, blah. And that's really easy to do, but what it does is it kind of downplays what they're feeling and it covers it up and it doesn't make them feel like you're connected with them. You're not compassionate about what they're feeling. So what is empathy? It's seeing the world as others see it, being non-judgmental, identifying another person's feelings, Communicate your understanding of their feelings. You don't have to sit there and cry with them, but you can say, I understand why you're sad. Tell me more. Do you want to talk about it? So our patients have a unique experience, and um, we wanted you guys to know kind of what it, what it looks like from their perspective um, when they don't feel compassionate, connected care. So we're gonna watch this quick video of a gentleman here um, in the hospital. And this is his perspective of what's going on around him, just in a quick two minutes. Pond5.com. Little text did send the washer broke and the car won't Hi, Hey, thank you. Welcome to the Tonight Show. We got a great show for you on the Tonight Show. Musical guest like you wouldn't believe. Hi. 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 Okay, you're looking perfect. You're looking really good. Looking really good. Okay, I'll be back to checking. You got an hour? Yummy. Feeling hungry, Mr. Jones? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. 
Somebody mentioned to me prior, I couldn't hear anything in the video. That's intentional. He was hard of hearing. So that's why you guys couldn't hear most of the things that were happening in that video. So what might add to this patient's anxiety that we saw in that video? Caregiver didn't knock on the door or introduce herself. He doesn't know what she's here to do. He couldn't reach his tray or see what was on it. Did you guys notice that when they put it down, they didn't even get it close to them or tell them what was on the tray. Somebody else mentioned in another training is that they deliver food and people may not remember what they ordered or the nurse had maybe ordered for them or they don't know what that food is particularly on their tray. So explaining that could be helpful. The caregiver uh, talked to his family member and he couldn't hear what was being said. He doesn't know why his blood pressure was being taken or whether it was good or bad. She said, your vitals are perfect, it's good. But didn't tell him what the, what the vitals were. The alarms were loud. He doesn't know what an alert is or if it was a major problem. She just silenced it. Okay, we're good, sorry about that. Explaining those things is very helpful. So what are your thoughts on the video? <coughs> and what did you guys think that could be done differently now that seeing it from what a patient sees? Even if you're doing like routine stuff, making sure you're explaining it. Yeah, yeah, we expect a lot of patients to know exactly what we're doing when we come in the door. Especially like, even though we're color coded, I don't know how many people read the pamphlet saying, oh, this color means this before we actually come in the room. A lot of people don't know what we're there for. Anybody else? I've watched this video a lot of times and the one thing that I noticed today was that both the nurse and the who I think was a tech or, or something was they were both very friendly smiled on their face they appeared very polite but it still didn't connect it so it doesn't matter the the what their face necessarily looked like but taking that extra step to to chat with him and make sure he understood and also he looked very nervous yeah yeah like he had some anxiety or he was at one point i saw his hand raised and nobody like checked in with him do you need something mm -hmm. all four bedrooms were up uh, yeah i'm assuming because we could always see yeah bodies, but just assume. Mm -hmm. <laughs> makes, makes you feel kind of closed in so different anxiety triggers from our patients is that they don't know where they're supposed to go, especially if they walk in the door and you kind of see them looking around. The person at the desk is ignoring me. I don't know what I'm supposed to do next. I've been waiting for three hours and no one has updated me on what is going wrong. The staff member was rude. I feel like I'm a bother to them. Sometimes you don't, you may be having a rough day and how you come off um, can be how the patients feel that you're being rude or that you're being bothered by what they're asking for. I pushed my button and I really have to go to the bathroom. My daughter is in surgery tonight and I thought I would hear something by now. This was one that stood out to me because a lot of times we think about, okay, we get everything we need for our patients, but we also have to remember um, the families in the room too. And they're just as worried sometimes, if not more than the patients are. Um, how am I going to manage this when I get home? I'm not really sure if I'm gonna be able to do the same things or how do I do the same things? How do I work the same things? The third objective we're going to go over is identifying personal preferences that allow you to care for the person as well as our patients. So, who is this guy? I can tell you his name's Fred. He's a patient in room 503, cardiac patient. But who is he really? Do we really know who our patients are? So, could you guys tell me one thing about a patient that has nothing to do with their diagnosis. You'll hear us ask people throughout the day um, to get everybody to connect with this module is something that has nothing to do with the reason why they're here. This is a challenge I want you guys to do when you're, when you're out and about with your patients today or the next time that you work. Try and find something out about that patient that has nothing to do with why they are sick and 
and while they are here. Why does it matter? Because when patients feel safe and truly cared for, they share their concerns, their feelings, details about their diagnosis that may lead to us caring for them better. When we know the person, we can build a better plan of care that fits their specific needs. And as we were talking earlier, there's also research, research stating that when patients feel compassionate, connected care, they actually get better faster, right? So how do we make a connection? Something very simple, 30 to 60 seconds. Good morning, I understand during handoff that you like to be called Bob. Did I get that right? We have a lot of patients that have different names than what they're actually called. I'm Sarah, this is what I'm gonna be doing today. I'm gonna to do your assessment. I wanna to get to know you better. Tell me something about you. What do you like to do when you're not here? So three different ways we do it in succession. Ask, find common ground, make a connection with them, ask them about something personal, and then create an opening for further discussion next time. Then they get excited about seeing you next. It's not just about when you're bringing my meds next. I want to tell you about my grandkids because you asked about their painting on the wall. So we're going to take 60 seconds, we'll say. Turn to the person behind you, in front of you, next to you. I'll give you 60 seconds to find out two things that you did not ever know about them that has nothing to do with their job here at Methodist. Somebody tell me one thing you learned about somebody else in this room that you had no idea about. It has nothing to do with their work here. Anybody? What'd you learn? She's like how they got the most grandkids, and I've never heard. Oh, all right. How many? I have 17 grandchildren and four great-grandchildren. Wow, that's amazing. Anybody else? <laughs> What, what did you learn? Yes. He swam with sharks. Oh, nice. See? <laughs> it takes a very small portion of your day to learn about somebody else, and it makes them feel cared for, connected. It's probably something that you'll remember the next time you see them. We're usually running around most of the day. We can make these connections with our patients, our coworkers. Um, different ways we can do that. Walk into the patient's room. Just look around for cues in the room. Food tray, I see you haven't eaten anything. Do you not like what they brought up? Is this not what you ordered? Would you prefer to have something different? Are you not feeling hungry? The weather, everybody loves to talk about the weather, right? So look out the window. Oh, looks, it looks like a, a cloudy day today. I wonder if it's going to rain. Personal items in the room. This is how I get a lot of people talking. Oh, that's a cute picture. Is that your daughter? Is that your granddaughter? Um, did someone draw that for you? Or a blanket or flowers? Who bought you those? They must really care for you. Just open. So ways we can show a personal connection. Very simple, like we said. Introduce yourself. Ask them about their preferred name. Look around the room for those conversation starters. Ask open-ended questions. Um, you'll notice, like, if you have children, you're like, how was your day at school today? Good. Not really an open-ended question, right? Tell me your most favorite thing you ate at lunch today? Or who did you sit next to at lunch today? Leave it more for conversation openers. Share a few details about yourself. It's okay to, to share some personal things with our patients. They feel more connected to us. Recall details from previous interactions. If you've seen this patient before, hey, last time you were here, you told me about such and such. And then pass along those details to anybody else that's engaged in their care. Um, even if you don't, you don't find it important, the patient finds it important, and that's why they're talking about it. So we also need to consider and have awareness that not every time is the right time to start a conversation with people. They may be in a tough situation or just got a tough diagnosis, and we kind of need to manage when is the right time um, to dip your toes in the water of conversation. Do you want to talk about that right now? If they say no, understand and back off. So what if your work isn't at the bedside? What if you don't see patients every day? Other things you can do, acknowledge people when you encounter them, say hi or smile in the hallway. Escort people to their destination instead of just saying, it's down the hall second, oh, by the exit sign. Actually walk them there, that helps reduce their anxiety. Be mindful about conversations that you have in public areas. 
Offer a warm blanket to a person you see napping in the chair. Not your coworkers, just kidding. Mm -hmm. Share the location of a quiet place to rest or how they can connect to our Wi-Fi so they can get some work done while their loved one is in surgery. Provide information about a good place to eat or mention that we have amazing omelets on Fridays and they should check out our cafeteria. Offer a tissue when you see somebody crying. The last thing we're going to do is personalize all these strategies um, and figure out how to work them into our daily routine. So two things uh, that we want you to self-reflect on during this training is how often do you recognize that anxiety is suffering? And how often do you demonstrate caring that transcends diagnosis? So when we go back, we can go to the personal story, strategy. These are three things that we want you guys to focus on to be interactive. What is one thing anybody in the room can stop doing that they've noticed, ooh, that might be encouraging suffering for my patients? What's one thing you are going to stop doing after seeing some of this information today? Yes? Well, I've changed my uh, ring phone or alarm on my phone because I noticed a long time ago that holy cow, it scared me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. That's great. Anybody else? Acting rushed, yeah. I always feel like I have a million things to do when if I just took time to do the one thing, maybe maybe those million things would just take their time. They'll get done eventually. What will you continue doing? Something you already do that you know is reducing uh, patient suffering. Always introduce yourself. Always introduce yourself, absolutely. Ask how they're doing. Ask how they're doing, yeah. What's one thing you're gonna start doing Something new. Mine was particularly simple that every time I see somebody in the hallway and they're like, how's your day going? I always say, good. How's your day? Good. And then we cross paths. It's always good. Whether I'm having a terrible day or an awesome day, the answer is always good because it's just routine, right? It's hard to stop yourself from doing that. So that was my challenge was when I cross paths with people in the hallway and they're like, how, how are you doing? I want to say, oh, I'm incredibly blessed today. Or it's not the best day, but I'm getting through it. But having more than the one word response that's just canned and everybody expects to hear it. So that was something real small and simple. Anybody have another like small and simple thing you could do? Smile and walk across the Smile, absolutely. It makes a huge difference. And a lot of people, you don't know what kind of day they're having and that could change their entire day. Little summary of the things we went over. We described the compassionate connected care and why we're using it here at Methodist Fremont. How to implement it, overcoming barriers, and giving you a few ideas on how to start the conversation with your patients and how to personalize it. So like I said in the beginning, you'll see some of us that are um, trainers walking around and asking people, hey, tell me one thing you learned about your patient today that has nothing to do with the patient because we want to encourage people to use the information um, that they're learning in these modules. So like I said, there is five modules, so look out for module two, sign up is already out, three and four will be coming. Um, make sure you sign up for the live modules. They, they go pretty quick, and it's something that the Methodist Fremont Health is really interested um, in getting back into care.